After Einstein published his quantum theory of light, the physics community was shocked, but far from convinced. It is safe to say that nobody believed this. Physicists pay attention to what Einstein wrote, but they could not accept that light, known to be a wave, could sometimes behave like a particle. There was only one way to disprove his unpopular idea, experimentally check its predictions. This is a follow-up video on this ongoing series, so you are highly encouraged to check the rest of the playlist for context. Almost nobody knew about Einstein before the publication of his revolutionary article proposing particles of light, but in a few months during 1805, Einstein's name became well known for his boldness to propose one radical idea after another. But he also became scientifically respected, because despite his rebellious proposals, his articles came with clear supporting evidence, solid mathematical and physical foundations, and more importantly, with a specific experimental predictions to test their validity. Einstein proposed that light is emitted and absorbed in packages of energy H nu. He showed that this was a physically and mathematically acceptable idea and solved the problems that Leonard observed in his experiments with the photoelectric effect. There was just one big problem with Einstein's proposal. Experiments show that light had wave properties, in agreement with Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. The physics community saw no reason to abandon a successful theory verified by experiments. Einstein pushed the limit by suggesting that all the wave phenomena of light were observed mostly at low frequencies, so maybe at high frequencies the particle properties of light would dominate. After Einstein's papers were published in 1805, one person who got really hooked by them was Max Laue, a theorist and assistant to Max Planck in Berlin. Planck did not accept Einstein's quanta, but relativity and his theory of Brownian motion really impressed the father of Prussian physics. He sent Laue to personally check on this unknown Albert Einstein. They met in Bern and became good friends for life. If you watch my video about Heisenberg and the German bomb, you might remember Max Laue as one of the 10 prisoners in Operation Epsilon. Laue deserves its own video. Here it is important to mention that he discovered in 1912 that X-rays can be diffracted by crystals. This revelation not only created the new field of X-ray crystallography used until the present day and gave the Nobel Prize to Laue in 1914, but confirmed the validity of the wave nature of light at high frequencies. This was hard to understand within Einstein's theory of light quanta. During the same period, Robert Millikan became the most renowned experimental physicist in the United States after his remarkably precise measurement of the electron's charge. He was a controversial character, quite arrogant, influential, and politically powerful. In fact, after the Fletcher Millikan experiment, many other measurements of the electron's charge appeared to disagree with Millikan's value, but nobody had the courage to challenge the great and powerful Millikan. That was a risky move, and instead, young scientists found excuses to justify their measurements to make them match Millikan's result. It was later found that Millikan had the wrong value for the viscosity of air. After correcting for this, all the later results finally agreed. For years, the conservative Robert Millikan was so fed up with the attention that Einstein's idea was gaining that he saw himself as the only one who could put a stop to what he called unthinkable, bold, and reckless hypothesis of light particles in the way that he knew best, a carefully designed and insanely precise experiment. While Millikan was measuring the electron's charge, many others attempted to check Einstein's predictions. In 1907, Erich Landenburg in Berlin found that the speed of photoelectrons increases with the frequency of ultraviolet light. Carl Taylor Compton, brother of the famous Arthur Holly Compton, with his doctoral advisor Owen Richardson at Princeton, as well as Arthur Hughes, a student of J.J. Thomson in Cambridge, made in 1912 what Millikan called the most reliable work on the photoelectric effect. But in all cases, the linearity between energy and frequency was unclear. Results were always inconclusive. Millikan decided to experimentally test Einstein's formula for the photoelectric effect because this would allow him to disprove the three predictions at once. The method was in principle very simple. According to Einstein, when shining light of frequency nu over a metal, 
the photoelectrons are ejected with a maximum kinetic energy given by a linear function of the light's frequency. On the contrary, the actual experimental apparatus was a technological miracle. Milligan's graduate students, Albert Hennings and W. H. Kaddish, helped him build several advanced versions of Leonard's experiments using a powerful mercury lamp and carefully crafted filters to precisely select the frequency of light to shine over different metals. He also incorporated a rotary wheel containing three different metals to be tested, lithium, sodium, and potassium. Millikan, in his classic fashion, attempted such a high level of precision that the measurements would have to take place in vacuum to make sure that nothing could alter the photoelectrons. Leonard had found that many metals rapidly corroded affecting the measurements. To avoid this issue, the metal would have to be carefully cleaned between measurements for consistency. But how to do this in vacuum? Milligan designed a way to machine the material inside a vacuum chamber, a blade to scratch the metals before each measurement, as well as the wheel with different metals were controlled from the outside by a collection of rotating electromagnets. The whole contraption is a marvel that Millikan describes in detail on his paper and calls it a machine shop in vacuo. Although he is the sole author of the paper, sounds familiar, he acknowledged his graduate students and his skilled technician named Julius Person. Another advantage was that Millikan's apparatus allowed him to scan a wide range of frequencies compared to previous experiments. This was the ninth iteration of his device. To measure the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons ejected from the metal, he applied a voltage to stop them. To understand the idea, imagine that you are asked to determine the maximum kinetic energy of tennis balls coming out of one of those tennis ball launchers used for practice. One simple way is to point it vertically, shoot balls straight up and measure the maximum height reached by the balls and select the highest measure value. Then, by conservation of energy, the initial kinetic energy of this ball becomes only potential energy that can be calculated using the mass of the ball, the acceleration of gravity, and the measured maximum height. What Milligan did was quite similar, but instead of gravity slowing a tennis ball, he used a potential difference slowing the photoelectrons. Instead of measuring the maximum height, he measured the voltage that stops the photoelectrons. And instead of the mass, the relevant quantity needed is the electric charge, and Millikan has just measured the most precise value of the charge of the electron. Here we see a nice synergy between Millikan's projects. This is how he measured this. When light of a particular frequency shines over one of the metals, photoelectrons of different energy are emitted from the surface. If we add a conducted collector of photoelectrons on the other side and close the loop, electrons flow and a current will appear. Now we can try to stop the photoelectrons from reaching the collector by including a battery in the circuit with an inverted polarity, so that the collector becomes negatively charged, which will repel the incoming photoelectrons. Since less electrons are now flowing through the wire, the electric current decreases. By increasing the voltage, the current decreases even more. At some point, even the most energetic photoelectrons will be deflected away from the collector and the current will drop to zero. This is called the stopping voltage and it tells us the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons in the form E times V equals K max. Here we can set K max to be Einstein's formula, from where we get the expression used by Millikan. In October 1912, a year and a half after his publication of the oil drop experiment, Millikan began his measurements, and as he wrote, these measurements occupied practically all my individual research time for the next three years. Powering the electromagnets to move pieces inside the device, rotating the wheel, cleaning the sodium metal, and shining a pristine sample with light of specific frequencies. Working hard so nothing could disturb his experiment, Milly can obtain a perfect straight line, just like Einstein had predicted. I can only imagine his frustration when his measurements produce such a clear linear relation. For years, experiments have weakly suggested that this was indeed the case. Although the linearity was far from perfect, and even quadratic relations could be fit to the data. But here, Millikan had the most precise and carefully designed experiment, and now the cleanest possible data, which contrary to Millikan's expectation, confirmed the first of Einstein's prediction in all its glory. After powering up the electromagnets to rotate the wheel, cleaning the lithium metal, and shining a new sample with the same frequencies, 
Millikan saw in disbelief the appearance of a new straight line. Not only that, it was perfectly parallel to the sodium line, meaning that the slope was the same, just like Einstein predicted. Millikan wanted to check now with potassium, but as he wrote, an accident prevented the inclusion of data on potassium. Remember that by liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing you contribute to the growth of the channel. With the two measurements of the slope, the final prediction of Einstein's theory could be tested. According to Einstein, the measured slope times the charge of the electron should be equal to Planck's constant. In Millikan's mind, there was no way this slope times the charge that took him years to measure with his oil drops would have anything to do with Planck's constant. Remember that up to now, Planck's constant was just a quantity that appeared in the formula for the blackbody radiation. It had nothing to do with the photoelectric effect, unless Einstein was right. Taking the slope from sodium and inserting what Millikan calls his value of E, he found a perfect agreement with the known value of Planck's constant. This is what physicist Abraham Pais called the second coming of Planck's constant. Millikan must have felt defeated. He wanted to prove Einstein wrong, but his carefully designed experiment showed him exactly the opposite. He denied the confirmation of the particle nature of light. Millikan defended the idea that his experiment confirmed Einstein's formula of the photoelectric effect, but not the reckless hypothesis behind the formula. And he spent years advocating for an alternative theory that could produce Einstein's formula without Einstein-like quanta. Such a theory never arrived. In his now famous paper, he shows his discomfort with the implication of the results, but ends with a truthful summary. Einstein's photoelectric equation has been subjected to very searching tests, and it appears in every case to predict exactly the observed results. Note that he only refers to Einstein's formula, not Einstein's hypothesis. And then he reports on his measure value of Planck's constant with a remarkable precision of half a percent. Just like with his oil drop experiment, Millikan studied and eliminated many sources of error and achieved this insane level of precision because he used a voltmeter calibrated and certified by the Bureau of Standards in Washington, thanks to Andrew Higgins for pointing this out a few days ago. I find it amusing that Millikan followed the step of his mentor, Albert Michelson, who almost 30 years earlier attempted to detect the luminiferous ether, built an amazingly precise instrument, and made history by finding the opposite of what he expected. In any case, Millikan reported what nature dictated to him in his experiment, despite the fact that it completely contradicted what he wanted to prove. This is a scientific method at work. In 1915, Millikan announced his preliminary results and published his final results in 1916. The following year, Millikan published a textbook titled The Electron, where he wrote, Despite the apparently complete success of the Einstein equation, it stands complete and apparently well-tested, but without any visible means of support. If the oil drop experiment made Millikan a celebrity, his validation of Einstein's formula got him immediately and literally every year nominated to the Nobel Prize. Ironically, it was Millikan's experiment that finally led the Nobel Committee to pay attention to the 47 nominations for the prize that Einstein had received since 1910. Finally, in 1921, Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. No explicit mention of his quantum theories of light and matter or relativity. Millikan's attempt to prove that Einstein was wrong backfired spectacularly and gave Millikan the Nobel Prize in 1923 for his work on the elementary charge of electricity and on the photoelectric effect. In his Nobel lecture, Millikan expressed his view once again. The general validity of Einstein's equation is, I think, now universally conceded, but the conception of localized light quanta, out of which Einstein got his equation, must still be regarded as far from being established. Even though half of the prize was for the oil drop experiment, Harvey Fletcher was not mentioned. In 1950, at 82 years old, Millikan published his autobiography. In the chapter about his photoelectric experiments, he provides a distorted version of reality, claiming that he was convinced about Einstein's particles of light the moment he saw the data in 1915. Even during his last years, 
his ego led him to reimagine history. After his work on the photoelectric effect, Millikan became the founding president of newly established Caltech, and with Europe just recovering from World War I, Millikan started the era of scientific development in the United States. Caltech became the main center for the study of cosmic rays. Sadly, Millikan was involved in many other improper activities, and his name has been removed from several buildings. In the previous video, I shared the story of Harvey Fletcher, not to make Millikan look bad, but to show that science is a human endeavor, and for this reason some aspects of human nature can affect the way science is done. Millikan proved Einstein right. Oddly enough, all experiments confirm the wave properties of light, and for most physicists, the idea of a particle of light was still hard to accept. Einstein proposed the particle-wave duality of light, but how could light behave as a wave and sometimes as a particle? In the early 1920s, Einstein's hypothesis was still received with disbelief by the scientific community. Despite the respect that the physics community had for Einstein and the remarkable validation of all its predictions that gave him the Nobel Prize, the persuasive Millikan convinced many that the photoelectric equation was correct, but based on the wrong theory. His authority, influence and strong personality was always hard to challenge. During the following decade, Millikan was at the center of another scientific battle about the nature of cosmic rays. This is another fascinating story that I have to share, so for sure we will meet Millikan again in the future. On two fronts, Millikan forcefully defended his views on the nature of light and the nature of cosmic rays. Fortunately, by this time there was one experimental physicist that dared to confront Millikan in these two battles, Arthur Holly Compton.